Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. It is June 22nd, 2014, and we're going to cover a few different books today, covering a bit wider span of time <laughs> than I had intended, but that's kind of how it goes. First, let's talk about another anthology, Realms of the Arcane. There's a framing device story here by Wes Nicholson, which really pretty much uh, seems to be saying it, it. it's kind of a metaphor for how Wes is taking over as editor of the TSR books, is what it seems like. It's also just kind of a fun little story, and I didn't mind it. It's it's kind of, it's, it's like, imagine the in-jokiness of the Volo stuff, but less of a joke, more of a story. So that was cool. I'm also just going to uh, start, rather than going through each one and doing a quick thing, I'm just going to tell you about the stories that stood out to me. The Grotto of Dreams by Mark Anthony is, interestingly enough, kind of a uh, a little side story about Undermountain that doesn't tie in to Escape from Undermountain that I remember, at least. But there there is a talking skull, and maybe it's the same one, but I would have thought that I would have connected it, and I swear it's a different name, but maybe it's the same one. In any case, The Grotto of Dreams is a short story about a talking skull and a uh, woman going through Under Mountain looking for this place called The Grotto of Dreams. It is very predictable what's going to happen, but the story is well written and uh, follows through on what it needs to do, and I enjoyed it. A Narrowed Gaze by Monty Cook has a really strong opening and a decent follow-through. Pretty good story, though weirdly I don't remember <laughs> what it was about. It's like... Uh, some of these uh, anthology ones, it's like, I remember, oh, I didn't like that, but I don't remember why, and vice versa. The Whispering Crown by Ed Greenwood, I want to point out simply for the fact that I read about half of it, because it starts out pretty strongly, but then it just kind of keeps going, and I was like, where the hell is the point in all of this? And I gave up, but I did like the fact that it didn't seem to just be about Elminster, it seemed about something completely different. I'm sure he shows up in the end, and he was the main female all along, or whatever, but... What are you going to do, right? Something I really want to point out here, Shadows of the Past by Brian M. Thompson. You know, I was so kind of disparaging of Thompson's novels and the Volo in jokes and blah, 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 blah. This one, this story, so good. And it looks like it's going to be a continuing story through the anthologies. I'm very excited about that. It's a kind of, uh, somebody wakes up with amnesia, doesn't know who they are, and starts being fed bits of information about who they might be and where they come from. It feels like a 2000 AD anthology story, uh, and I'm very excited about it. Also, Tertius and the Artifact by Jeff Grubb. This is kind of a Maltese falcony sort of story, uh, but done very humorously, and what's weird is this is exactly the sort of story that I kind of roll my eyes at and dislike, uh, for the most part in the realms, but Jeff Grubb is just so damn good that he pulls it off, uh, so yeah, that one is well worth reading. Let's move on now to a bit of a surprise. We're going to take a look at the years uh, about 1356 to 1360. <laughs> We're doing some cleanup here because there are some things where I'm like, I really don't know where this takes place, and I thought, I'll read a few pages of it. The Stone of Tamora trilogy by Gino and R.A. Salvatore. This trilogy came out around 2007 to 2010, so something around... Uh, maybe 2005 to 2008. In any case, it came out about the same time as the other stuff that we're reading for the most part here. And it's a much more young adult introduction to the realms. But I figured, A, it's probably going to be a quick read. Uh, B, it might tie in with the Driz stuff in some way. And uh, C, why not, right? So I gave it a shot. Uh, the one thing that I'm not giving a shot that somebody might bring up at some point here just to get this out of the way, uh, to, I guess two things, actually. Vampire in the Mists, the Ravenloft one, the first Ravenloft novel, and there might be others, but that's the only one that I remember, stars a Forgotten Realms character, because, of course, Ravenloft uh, could suck you in from any world. So, at least in the old canon, or, you know, the old IP, I, 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 I don't even know who owns it anymore. I think White Wolf, but I don't think anybody has done anything with it for a long while. In any case, I'm, I'm not going to bother with that because it seems far more about a different land's continuity than anything involved in Forgotten Realms. I mean, technically, I guess it would be a Realms book, but you know what I mean. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit the scope of what we're going for here. And on a similar note, 
The Spelljammer series, I believe, either stars a character from Toral or has a character from Toral, or I mean, has a character or stars a character from Kren and they visit Toral. But from everything that I've read, because I did look into it, from everything that I've read, it seems as if uh, Toral plays a very, very tiny part in it, that they're just like there for, you know, less than half a book and it doesn't really play in in any way, shape, or form. So. I'm skipping both of those for sure, but anything else that takes place in the realms that is real, um, you know, I do want to cover, at least to some degree. I'm still wondering about trying to find a copy of Council of Blades, because I just skipped that one without even trying, and for all I know, that was just the best book ever. Who knows? Paul Kidd, I have no idea if I've read any other stuff. Anyway, getting back to Stone of Tamora. So this is a little young adult trilogy. Here's the thing. <laughs> It took me a little while while I was reading these because, you know, at first I just assumed, and you could see in my notes from the last episode, assuming I don't barge another one in here from episode 45, you can see in my notes that I thought maybe this goes around, what was it, 14-something, because that seems about right with when it was published. Notes somewhere said that these characters crossed over. But in fact, this series takes place somewhere around 1356, 1357, and that's when the, like, present-day stuff in Book 1 happens, because it's a framing device that, if I did my math correctly, goes back 18 years, so technically it starts in 1339, I guess, and, and brings us up to speed there. So it's, in a way, it's kind of like, it, it kind of has a feel like the, uh, oh, uh, uh, Orson Scott Card's Ender Shadow uh, sort of thing, to Ender's Game, you know, where it's like, here's the story of Bean, who was in Ender's Game, but, oh, you know, all this other stuff was going on with him that you didn't know about, except this is a character who is never mentioned in the main story, and his story doesn't really tie into Drizzt and the Companions of the Hall story in any real way. It just, this is kind of like, you know, a lost tale from the time of, it would be the Halfling's Gem, I think, right? When, um... Uh, Regis is um, uh, captured and they're chasing after him. At first I thought it was going to tie in with, uh, oh, what is that? The one right before Silent Blade, uh, uh, Sea of Storms or Silent Passage or, or something like that, uh, where, where Drizzt and Cadbury were working on the Sea Sprite for a while. But no, no, no. In fact, it's way before that. This is like when they first deal with the Sea Sprite. One of the funny things, and I'll, I'll get around to my actual like review here in a moment, but just... <laughs> Covering a few bases here. One of the funny things is, if you remember from my review way back when about uh, that book where Drizzt and uh, Wolfgar set off across uh, the desert and I thought we were going to get some desert encounters and then the next chapter is just like, and then they arrived. Uh, here we get the desert encounters. We get some uh, desert encounter stuff. So if you were really, really missing out on that and didn't read that book because I said that... <laughs> Now you have some desert encounters to push right into that section. All right, so here's my feeling about this trilogy. It's written in this odd, I would say, Dickensian style, and that's Dickensian not in the sense of everything's poverty and um, uh, dirty and, you know, children are doing all these jobs. Dickensian in the sense that it's like, you know, I was born upon a rocky shore and my mother had... Three, you know, it just, it, it, three hairpins to a name, and it, it sounds as if it's being read in that hello, I am Pip voice, uh, the entire time. So it's very not engaging. It, it doesn't suck in a modern reader. Also, this is set, as I said, 20 years before what would be present day when this was coming out. So, if you know a displaced child visitor from the Dickens era, who wants to read about 20-year-old realms, this is perfect. You probably don't, however. And assuming that those people don't exist, this is horrible. I mean, here's the thing. You want to get a young reader involved with the Forgotten Realms, and you want them especially to start with the Drizzt stuff, because you think Drizzt is going to be exciting to young readers. You know what you do? You, you give them the Crystal Shard. Why is that? Why did they not realize we already have <laughs> an entry level young adult book 
that works for young adults, you know, I, or I just said that uh, you entry level young adult book that, that that's in print. I mean, I don't think it's ever gone out of print, at least in a um, uh, collected omnibus form of some sort or another. You know, maybe you don't start them with Sojourn and Exile. Those are a little slower, but start them with Crystal Shard. I, that book, I think, is perfect for, you know, a young reader who's interested in learning about the realms. This is just stupid and needless. In a way, because they keep meeting characters from all the, uh, at least the early Driz novels, it kind of feels like a Volo novel, except only encountering the Driz series. So that just seems silly. I mean, this was just, oh wow. I, I, I basically skimmed the entire thing because it's a fast read. I mean, they're like small hardbound books and they're about 280 pages each. But they're really big print, and they're a super fast to read, and so, I I don't know, I mean, but it's like there's just so much needless text in there that it's very easy to skim it and get the entire point. It's, you know, it wants to be a young adult Lord of the Rings because there's a magical talisman that keeps being thrown around and lost and blah, 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 and it wants to be a younger young adult Drizz series and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's almost as if, like, Salvatore forgot that he did anything before Road of the Patriarch with all of the, like, child abuse and stuff and was like, oh, you know, you can't start a child on the Drizzt series. I mean, it's, it just, it, it was a real disappointment and that made me sad. And as far as I know, that imprint didn't continue on with any other young adult stuff. Uh, if If I'm wrong and anybody knows anything else, let me know. Let's get back to our quote-unquote present. Back to the year 1375, Year of Risen Elfkin. <laughs> Elfkin. Let's talk about Stardeep by Bruce R. Cordell. So, I'll admit, so this is a, a Dungeons book, as I'm sure you're aware. Stardeep is a dungeon, and it plays heavily into everyone's lives. So there you go, it fit. I will admit, I did not like this book very much. Thought it was pretty dull, and I probably would have given up on it, except for two things. One... We're nearing the end of 3rd edition, and so I'm kind of like, oh, you know, seeing all this stuff fall away, I, I kind of want to push through everything that I can. And the other thing is that I really do want to force myself, even if I dislike some of it, to read the trilogies that pull us into 4th edition. And one of those trilogies is the Abyssal Plague uh, trilogy by Cordell, and I had actually read maybe 50, 100 pages of, uh, uh, what is the first one, Plague of Dreams, uh, Plague of Spells, Plague of Spells, I think. So I happen to know that um, a couple of the characters from here cross over into that, so I was like, oh, I need to know their backstory and whatever it means. I don't really think that it was necessitated in any way, shape, or form. But we do get the introduction of one of the best names out of the entire Forgotten Realms, and that is Rhydon K. And you have to say it that way with the emphasis, because he sounds like a pro wrestler or something. He needs like a really overdone, like three chord rock intro every time that he appears. Rhydon K. I don't remember much about Rhydon K. <laughs> Sadly, he's not really the star of this book. He just kind of is along for the ride, and that's really what it felt like for the most part. Everybody was just kind of along for the ride, you know? And it, it kind of felt like, I don't know what the point is here. We're just dealing with a dungeon that's been taken over and blah, 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 blah. But we get a little hint of the Aboleths trying to rise here. This really only works, I think, as a prequel to the rise of the Aboleths or Abolethic Sovereignty. There we go, not Rise of the Aboleths. The Rise of the Aboleths sounds pretty cool, right? I'd be curious to know, because, you know, when I talked to Jalee about her Dungeons book, she said that these were all brought about as standalone novels. I would be very curious to know if that was the case with this. I'm going to assume not. It would be far too shockingly coincidental if Cordell wrote this book in which an Aboleth was the main antagonist and, uh, you know, everything's about, like, stopping the Aboleth and uh, uh, somehow this accidentally became part of the Abolethic Sovereignty trilogy. Oh, also, another interesting thing about Stardeep, 
This is, I believe, the first time in the fiction, at least, that we're going along. It's possible it might have come up because, you know, the chronology of publication might be slightly different. But I believe that we've come across... This is the first time that a character has referred to the world as Abertoril. Abertoril. One of the characters mentions that as the name of the world, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Somebody let me know if I'm wrong here, but as far as I know, that whole Aber world was jammed in much later, only for fourth edition stuff. This idea that long ago they were the two worlds and then they combine again and so on and so forth. So that's momentous. I guess would be one way to put it. So, you know, not a not a great book, but not horrible. I mean, I just, you know, I don't really have anything to say about it. I'm hoping that the Abolethic Sovereignty plays a little better for me. I know what my problems were with it when I read it years ago. Now, perhaps, knowing that there was an entire book featuring many of these characters beforehand, those problems might be solved. So unless I find anything else that... um I realize that we've skipped over and I need to go back and deal with in the meantime. Next time we should be dealing with uh, Depths of Madness, uh, another Dungeons one, and, oh my god, finishing out the Whisper of Waves trilogy. I think Whisper of Waves we dealt with in 1st edition, 2nd edition, and now at the end of 3rd edition. So I think it covers all three of the first three editions, which is insane. I kind of wish it had gotten a 4th edition book. I don't know what you would have done with it, though. Half the characters would have been dead, and not building a canal, I guess. So, probably wouldn't have been that interesting of a book, but (laughs) just to just to keep the symmetry or whatever alive, um, consistency, that would have been cool. In any case, as you can tell, I'm starting to ramble here because I don't really have much to say about anything that we're covering that's positive, and that makes me a little sad. Really like that Brian M. Thompson short story from Realms of the Arcane. Check that one out. Until next time, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.